I can tell you, it's kind of a smaller city, uh, very neighborhood oriented. You know, all the neighborhoods have really distinct identities and um, they've kind of developed the, the downtown area in a nice way. So Milwaukee, I was actually thinking it reminded me a lot of Portland. So following Reed, she went to Stanford. Stanford. Stanford, sorry. And um, she went to study entertainment law, which I think is really appropriate given your obsession with pop culture. <laughs> but you decided that um, pretty quick that that wasn't for you. So why why the switch? Uh, yeah, so I went to law school. I didn't I, like a lot of people. I went to law school not knowing what I wanted to do. <laughs> um, it was better than going and working at Starbucks and being a barista. I'm like, oh, I'll go to law school. So, um, but I I actually wanted to go into entertainment law back in the days of also wanting to be a telephone operator and a beautician. I had also wanted to be like a triple threat. I wanted to be a dancer, singer, actor. I wanted to win Academy Awards and Tony Awards and have hit records. But I don't have any talent for any of that. So, <laughs> um, and so I figured, well, since I don't have any actual performance talent, I could still go to the Oscars and go to the Tonys if I'm their lawyer. <laughs> so I was going to be an entertainment uh, lawyer, but when I got there, I really fell in love with criminal law. Um, and I, I hadn't realized before, just, I thought everybody was obsessed with crime the same way I was. Um, and I learned in law school that wasn't true, because in criminal law, you read the cases for the purpose of, of learning the theory and the doctrine and the skills of lawyering, but I would read a criminal case and I didn't care about the whole thing or any of that stuff. I wanted to know why did those people do those horrible things? Like, you know, why would somebody do that? How did they get caught? I would make up entire you know backstories for the the people who became characters in my mind um, for these kind of cold cases we were reading, and uh, I I, I kind of knew I was hooked um, to the the world of criminal law, so I decided to be a prosecutor. And she, she did very well at Stanford. Okay. She, she graduated at the top of her class. And, what? Not quite. Close enough. Um, she won a judicial clerkship with the Ninth Circuit Court of Appeals, but she'd fallen in love with Portland, and so she had the opportunity to go back as an uh, assistant deputy district attorney. And um, she has something very unique about her conviction rate as a deputy district attorney. Why don't you show yeah, my, my, I said that I worked on some very interesting cases um, at the DA's office, but my friends, uh, I'm, I still have great friends from my few years um, at the DA's office. Um, to this day, they're still some of my best friends. But they still love to tease me that I was the only person ever to leave the district attorney's office with a net negative in terms of the number of days in prison and posed because one of the first cases I worked on at the district attorney's office um, involved a case, did, have you guys have heard of the Happy Face Killer? I think they made a Showtime movie based on the Happy Face Killer. But I had been obsessed with this case when I was in college and law school uh, because some nutty guy out there was sending newspaper, or sit, uh, sending letters to this investigative reporter at the local newspaper, the Oregonian, claiming to be a serial killer. And he would, you know, every few months he would send some creepy letter, like in all caps, you know, uh, in this kind of shaky scrawl saying that he had killed some woman or another somewhere in the country. And then he would sign it with a happy face and, and even joked, oh, I guess you could call me the happy face killer, you know, when I make headlines. And I was obsessed enough with this case that I would actually cut the articles out because it was so interesting to me. But one of the women that the happy face killer had claimed to have murdered was a woman called Tanya Bennett, who had been murdered in Portland uh, in 1990-something, or early 90s. And um, I started in the district attorney's office in 1995, I guess. And you know, it was Friday afternoon, and I get a phone call from the second person in charge in the office, one notch down from the district attorney himself. I'm like, this is not a good thing. <laughs> Friday afternoon, the boss is calling me. So I'm like, I'm either about to get fired or I'm about to get sexually harassed, one or the other. And he called me into his office and uh, he said, I, somebody told me you know how to write. And I had just finished an appellate clerkship, um, as Jen mentioned. So I said, yeah, I, I know how to write. He said, we need somebody to do some writing for us. And he said, you're gonna have to work all weekend. I'm like, ah, oh, working on the weekend is not my favorite thing to do. And he said, we've got this case 
Uh, and he starts, he starts telling me the facts. I was like, is this the happy face killer case? And he's like, how do you know about that? I'm like, oh, I have a file on the case. <laughs> so it turned out that that morning, uh, it was two mornings before that, in Vancouver, Washington, which is a suburb of Portland, Oregon, a guy had gotten arrested for killing his girlfriend. And they had him dead to rights for murdering his girlfriend. And he figured while he was confessing to the crime they had him on, he would go ahead and confess to everything else as well. And he starts saying, hey, have you heard of the happy face killer? Yeah, that's me. All that stuff in those letters, yeah, I did that. Um, and finally, they had this guy who supposedly had killed Tanya Bennett. The problem is two other people had already been convicted of killing Tanya Bennett five years earlier and had been serving sentences in prison for aggravated murder. Luckily, they had not been executed. <laughs> um, they were still alive. So the job was to get them out of prison and to get the new guy, the happy face killer, in prison. Getting the happy face killer into prison was pretty easy. Getting the two innocent people out actually turns out to be much harder than one would think. Um, because legally, there was no error in their trials. They were lawfully convicted. And so what if they're innocent? Everybody says they're innocent. So um, we helped get the two people out. So I was in the hole, as far as the office was concerned, you know, jokingly, I was in the hole by two aggravated murder sentences, <laughs> which was two life sentences. And I never did quite earn my way back out of that hole. So I was in a negative by the time I left. But it motivated <laughs> Judge McCall. Right, so that became, um, in part, uh, you know, fictionalized, of course, but I drew a lot on that case for what became my first novel, uh, Judgment Call. It's a fascinating case because when you want, you know, it's not the first time that innocent people have been convicted, unfortunately, but with all of those cases, it's a chance to look and see how in our system do two innocent people get convicted of aggravated murder. And this case was fascinating because it's not like nobody was alleging that some, you know, Sipowitz like cop had banged somebody in the head with a phone book until they confessed. What happened was um, this woman called Laverne Pavlinak, who was, I think, uh, in her, she was only in her 60s. She looked like she was about 102. But Laverne Pavlinak <laughs> had a 35-year-old boyfriend who was a convicted felon on parole. And there was some mild levels of abuse, probably both directions with them, frankly. Um, but this not exactly comfortable relationship and whenever her boyfriend would misbehave, she would call his parole officer to try to get him in trouble, to get the parole officer to come over and tell the boyfriend to stop drinking or tell the parole officer to stop hanging around his crummy friends or going to the bad bars or whatever. So she was always calling the parole officer to rat on her boyfriend. And so one day she calls to rat on her boyfriend and she says, I read about this murder in the newspaper. And at that point, Tanya Bennett was, uh, her body had just been found and the murder was unsolved. She said, I read about this murder in the newspaper, and I think my boyfriend had something to do with that. And so the parole officer goes over with, you know, a very skeptical eye about whether Laverne is telling the truth. He thinks Laverne is just, you know, blowing smoke. And so Laverne says, this is why I think that he did it. And she produces a matchbook um, cover from the bar where uh, Tanya Bennett had last been seen. And it said, uh, Tanya Bennett and um, had a phone number down for Tanya Bennett. It was actually Tanya Bennett's phone number. And she said, I found this in my boyfriend's um, jeans. I think he did it. And they go look into it a little bit. The problem is Tanya, it, it turns out to be her handwriting, not, <laughs> it looks just like Laverne's handwriting. So the parole officer keeps questioning Laverne, tell, like trying to get Laverne to crack, to say I'm making the whole thing up so that the parole officer can go back and eat his lunch and forget about Laverne and the boyfriend and everything. So he keeps pushing her to, to admit that she's lying. And she finally says, I know he killed Tanya Bennett because I was there. <laughs> and he's like, excuse, what, what, what? Yeah, and uh, she says, I know he killed Tanya Bennett because I was there. And then if, if you know, if you watch enough TV, you know that the line between being there and becoming an accomplice is pretty thin. So she starts not only saying I was there, she starts saying, I went and got the rope out of the car, I held her down, and before you know it, Laverne Pavlinek's arrested for being an accomplice to murder. And she immediately revokes her, uh, her confession. But the problem is she gave such a detailed confession that it was hard to retract it. It seemed like she knew things that you could only know if, if she had been there. And so a jury convicted her on the basis of her retracted confession, 
and then the boyfriend, the poor boyfriend was such a drunk,